Hi, good morning, everybody, Pro Dog Raw. Uh, I'm Caroline Spencer, and we've got Debbie Connolly here today talking to us about the imminent XL bully ban, which we all would love some clarification on. And hopefully, you know, Debbie is going to be able to uh, point us in the right direction there. But Debbie Connolly, if you don't know her, she is one of the UK's most sought after expert court witnesses for the Dangerous Dog Act cases. Now, Debbie assesses, reports and appears in court as an expert witness for dangerous dog cases in England, Scotland and Wales. And she's had many years of experience. So um, I'm going to bring her on right now. She's going to talk us through the process of how it is now and how it's expected to be for the XL bully owners and the consequences of not doing anything, what we expect to happen if and when this um, act comes in for the XL bully. So let me just bring you on. There we go. Hi, Debbie. Thank you so Hello. much. Oh, I'm a bit this is, um, My head's a bit big. <laughs> a, a very, very busy lady um, right now. Um, yes. So thank you so much for taking this time to spend with us to explain as best you can with the information that we, we have of how yeah. things are going to be moving forward. So I suppose the first question really uh, is um, you know, the definition of the Excel yeah. bunny. Have we got any clarification on that yet? Um, yes and no. A little bit has crept through, which I'll touch on in a minute. Um, firstly, brief apologies for the late start. Entirely my fault. The phone's never stopped ringing, as usual. Um, yes, uh, I, I'm i a dog behaviourist of 37 years' experience. Um, I somewhat specialise in the big working breeds that I own myself. I currently have five dogs and three cats and a madhouse. So... Um, the expert witness work I've done for about eight years now, I've worked for dozens of different solicitors against and for various police forces. So um, if I could just briefly explain our role, our, our job is to be independent. Our job is to bring an independent view um, in a report to the court. And it's important to understand an assessment is not a pass or fail. It is essentially an interpretation. So our job is to say, this is why we think the dog is behaving like this. We've seen the evidence. This is what we think about the incident. And our job is to be entirely independent and to bring a, a completely independent view to the court via a, a report. Um, the the Excel bully thing is, um, bear with me one second, because my screen, I think I'm going to have to go full screen with this to stop it from, um, I don't know how to do that. Um, I can hear you all right, see you all right. Yeah, no, it's not that the sc screen's screen not recognising that I'm doing something and it keeps dimming. Um, so I'm trying to work out if I can go full screen on it so that it will um, stop doing that. Um, hmm, okay. Um, can I do settings here? sorry people i'm just going to keep tapping the screen otherwise right so sorry I'll, I'll carry on i might have to keep tapping the screen um so um so our, our job as as expert witnesses is to be sufficiently experienced that the court accepts that our word is valid there's no specific qualification for that and a lot of people have questions about that later i imagine but an assessment is an interpretation it's not it's, it is a test it's to some extent but it's not a pass or fail so the XL bully thing, let's explain the law first. We currently have four breeds that are uh, technically banned. And um, we're mainly familiar, I think everybody's familiar with the Pitbull Terrier. So let's kind of stick with that because that's most of what we, we tend to know about and deal with. The law says that um, a dog only has to be type. And this is the crucial point in this. If... The process is started, which is usually a police officer says, I think that dog might be a pit bull, a toes or whatever. That's the starting point of the process. And that person, that police officer will say, we may or may not seize the dog. Usually they do, but not always. We're going to take that dog away. We're going to measure it. We're going to put it against the, the pit bull standard and we're going to see how close it is. And this is the crucial point. 
The law says the dog only has to have a substantial number of the characteristics of the type of dog it's being accused of being. And as you can imagine, there's no legal definition of um, what is substantial. Um, some of the independent experts work on a percentage basis. So if it's over a certain percentage against all of the 60 odd points of a pit bull terrier, if it's against that, as a percentage, how many of those does it have? But there's that's not a legal um, a, a agreement. Um, the police tend to do their two-week course, uh, even if they've never met the pit bull before, and suddenly they're experts in breeds, and um, often it's a kind of cut-and-paste checklist. We've even had evidence from police forces where they've forgotten to change the name of the dog um, and just copied and pasted information. I believe that the independent experts are doing a better job of a thorough measurement and identification. Now, let me give you some of those characteristics because I think they're going to become important. Um, in the Pitbull Terrier, you're looking at, as a percentage, how much bigger is the, the skull from the stop here to the back against the, the chest, etc. Does the point of elbow fall below the rib cage or above it? Does it have a pump handle tail? Does it have, and this is one of the most subjective points, and it actually says the dog must have a light, springy gait. So flat-footed dogs, th that's not a point. Um, dogs who have very straight back legs, which we see quite a lot of, they surely do not have a light, springy gait because they're quite flat-footed and heavy. So this is the sort of both precise and subjective data we're dealing with in saying, I think that dog's a type. I think it has enough. The problem with that is some of it's subjective and the end result is if a person says, well, I, I don't accept that, they can employ their own independent expert to fight the police. Our job is to examine the dog, measure it. If we agree, fine. If we don't agree, it goes to court and we all have an argument about it. And the court decides whose evidence they favour. So that's the background to this. These dogs are type, not breed. Therefore, there's no DNA. There's lots of stuff on the internet. Go and get your dog DNA tested. And again, we'll cover this more uh, properly in a minute. But um, go and get your dog DNA tested and carry it with you and give it to the police if they accuse you. No, won't make the slightest bit of difference. Nor does any form of paperwork or registration make a difference. It cannot be used. It is entirely an interpretation of the dog against this standard. Now, the problem we've got with the XL bullies is when the act started in 1991, there weren't any XL bullies. Um, there wasn't even an American bulldog. That's stuff that's developed over the last particularly 10 years, but particularly over the last three or four years. When the Dangerous Dogs Act came in, the American Dog Breeders Association already had a version of the Pitbull standard, which is in some detail, height, length, ratio of this against ratio of that, the pump handle tail, etc. Therefore, that was an easier starting point than this because the XL is not a breed. None of these are recognised as breeds in this country. We are talking about a definition that's been created by essentially at least two, if not three clubs in this country who've been importing American Bulldogs and the bigger ones as the XLs, breeding on from them. And the XL is, is essentially in those standards, and they're a little bit basic, but those standards are um, essentially an American Bulldog, but bigger. And I think, um, I've just been discussing this with a colleague this morning, I think both the standards say that the upper height to the shoulder, and again, there's some technicalities on that, but it's 23 inches in the males. That's not that big. And, and there are dogs substantially bigger than that who... Um, who technically are going to fit the rest of the description. So the the two clubs in this country, I believe, have both spoken to DEFRA and have put their version of this definition in, and they've spoken to them about this height and weight and what this breed is all about. Um, I don't know if anybody saw Teresa Coffey, but that's worth a conversation in a little while. Um what we've therefore got is the government by the end of the year has to produce a standard that is robust enough to be challenged in court, stand up in court, to prove that a dog is or is not 
this new type of dog an excel bully so forget your dna forget your paperwork it will be like all of the rest it will be based on how close is that dog to this standard yet to be determined and I think until we get through the first few um, challenges from people who say, no, it's not, it's too big, it's too small, whatever, I, I don't think we're going to be able to say how robust this description will be. I can only tell you that myself and quite a lot of my expert colleagues are somewhat concerned at the short time scale to produce this and put it through as law for the ban next year. Um, Teresa Coffey spoke in Parliament the other day. She made it quite clear it's happening no matter what. Um, that she's not interested in your petitions or your opinion or anything else for that matter. Um, she is doing it regardless and claimed that they were very close to actually producing this uh, standard that we don't know what it is yet. Um, it, it's it's a bit of a minefield and it's best to guess. And at the moment, we're just uh, getting bits of feedback from here, there and everywhere. Um, the police had a meeting about uh, oh, probably two weeks ago now. Um, didn't invite any of us, of course. They've had their own little meeting to discuss it. Um, from speaking to officers who attended that, it's, it's a lot of, well, we don't know yet. Um, it might be this. We think it'll be like this. It was possibly a little bit early for that conversation. Because until that standard is in our hot little hands and we can start dissecting it, looking at what we're dealing with, it is best guesswork. But if you're interested, if you Google Excel Bully Standard, it will take you to a couple of the clubs who've essentially got an American Bulldog Standard. And then the Excel is, is described as a bit bigger version of that. That will give you some idea and a starting point. Right. Right. I suppose it can be quite confusing as well. You know, if it's if it's a type, you might have <coughs> a great big Labrador crossed with a staffy that looks like. So, as you say, it's you know, not, not even carrying a DNA test. is No, and, and it's, it's a good point because that's exactly what we've got now. You know, we, we have an issue of any dog of any parentage that is sort of square and stocky may have never met a, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier or any bull breed uh, in its life. Um, mm. But it, it looks a bit like one. It measures up as one, and it is one. And and that is exactly the subjective problem we're going to have with this, probably more so because I don't believe the standard is going to be robust enough. But it will probably have to further be amended and changed as challenges are made, and it will probably take 12 months to get it to any sort of point of um it, it it's working or it isn't it is a concern and and i know yeah. it's a concern for people out there who have various large breed mix-up dogs who may well fall under this new type it, it is a concern yeah so where does that leave people if it is it going to be a, a voluntary owner led registration thing or is it going to be you're going to be pulled over <laughs> now if you have got something that looks like um an xl bully but has got new you know is, is a labrador cross something else yeah. um and you and you um think you ought to get it neutered or something um it's it it leaves many many questions about are yeah. you putting your hand up too soon and are you labeling a dog that people wouldn't label necessarily anyway it, it's a difficult thing i mean the the concern we have is let's start with numbers Teresa Coffey herself said she'd been quoted anywhere from 4,000, I think, by the Blue Cross, which I think is far too low, um, up to 10,000 from somebody else. The clubs themselves are saying 50,000 upwards. I think I think somewhere between the second and third one is probably somewhere near the truth of the dogs that may be one. Um, if you think your dog is one, then prepare. Now, the reason for preparing is if you're challenged by the police who say, think that dog's going to fit the XL. That's that's dogs are a banned breed. You stand more chance of it staying at home until the, the court proceedings if the dog is already covered by the basics. Basics are that it's already neutered, that it's reasonably well behaved. They don't have to be perfect, they're dogs. And also that the chip's up to date, crucial because I'm sick of seeing ones in court that are not up to date. And that you are covered by public liability insurance. And the only way to get that is through the Dogs Trust. You join the Dogs Trust as a member for £25 a year and you then have public liability insurance, third-party insurance, essentially for all of your household dogs. Now, 
There's been um, a bit of a, let's call it a rumour and a confusion going around on Facebook, which was repeated as, as late as yesterday, which is not correct. People have been saying, oh, no, the Dogs Trust are refusing to ensure them. That is not true. I've spoken to the Dogs Trust. The confusion arose because people were getting in touch with the, with the Dogs Trust um, to ensure their dogs and were being told, we're not giving you a certificate yet. Well, that's made them think they're not covered. That's not the point. Right. At the moment, XLs are not a banned breed. So when you join the Dogs Trust, they're just dogs. They're covered on that like any other pet that you own, a Yorkshire Terrier, a Labrador, whatever. It will change in January if this ban is passed because they will then give you a specific uh, certificate. You have to prove that your dog is neutered and you have to supply the relevant paperwork from the court. We'll come back to that in a minute. But they are covering them. Don't confuse the fact that they're not issuing you a specific certificate yet with not covering them. That's not true. That's the only place you can go and get the cover that's required. You have to have either third party or um, public liability. It's kind of the same thing with very subtle differences. And you can only get it. You can't get any health insurance for the uh, of Anbridge. You can't get anybody else to cover them. That's your only option. So if you fear that your dog might be covered by this the sensible thing to do is get it neutered get the insurance in place do any extra training or any bits and pieces that you need to do in the meantime and be ready for that day of challenge you stand a damn sight better chance of keeping that dog at home rather than the police sticking it in a kennel there's been a lot of comments about they couldn't possibly fit all the dogs in kennels that that need to be checked completely yeah. agree with that they're struggling about at least 12 forces i've spoken to in the last uh, two months alone are already struggling for kennel space for the other stuff that they're dealing with on a normal basis. There is a problem. Now, there's there's an alarming thing coming out of this, and it did happen when the 1991 Act came in, and I know people are going to probably be very shocked, but I'm assured this is going to happen. And I think T Teresa Coffey referred to it the other day, a compensation scheme. Essentially, we believe it will be hand your dog over to be destroyed and will compensate you. Now, that is a concerning factor. Um, it apparently happened when the 1991 Act came in and people could get rid of their uh, pit bull terriers. Um, and uh, Theresa Coffey, I'm sure, referred to this compensation scheme because that's being decided. Um, we're already seeing dogs abandoned, tied to railings, dumped in rescue, people with litters that they're dumping because they can't sell them anymore. The, the, the short-term welfare crisis of these types of dogs is, is really horrible. You know, you've got rescues already. Some of them have been told not to even advertise the dogs anymore. Um, one of my concerns is um, the RSPCA, as soon as this ban was um, recommended, suggested by uh, Rishi Sunak, they sent a directive to all of their centres. And the directive, which there is a copy of online, the directive told the centres to stop advertising Excels at that point, which is, what, a month or more away now? Stop advertising them, remove them from the websites, and and an even odder thing was to try and reclaim ones that had been recently rehomed already. Now, I have a good authority from at least four dog pounds that that directive, for want of a better word, I did ask the RSPCA about it. I'll mention that in a minute because I don't just say things randomly. Um, apparently, that directive was recommended to all of the councils, um, and the various councils have already adopted that policy. Just a few days ago, I saw a post that said, I found this stray XL bully. The council have said they're not picking up XLs. But how is this helping? For a start, they have a statutory responsibility to collect stray <clears> dogs. <throat> that's, that's part of the instrument. How is this helping anybody? It, it's, I said quite early on it would be useful if the, if the government puts some money into neutering schemes and... Um, and, and an advert telling people where they could get insurance. And, you know, they, they've done it for so many other things. And I think they are yeah. hugely underestimating the welfare crisis for dogs and people in this. And yeah. it's just not being uh, funded properly. It's just not being dealt with properly. It is a huge concern. My, my slight concern about um, uh, about people like the RSPCA, who obviously publicly are completely anti-BSL. I did ask them for an explanation as to why 
the last remaining months when these dogs could potentially find a permanent keeper and be saved were lost because they just were they just stopped and then told other people to stop um the response i got was yes we are anti bsl we're not commenting not helpful um and they have just uh, according to Teresa coffee i think the dogs trust and probably the rspc as well by now have walked away from the discussion table on this matter going forward um, Teresa Coffey said it was essentially because they're arguing it shouldn't happen rather than offering anything practical to solve the problem going forward. Um, and I would imagine that that is the case. It, it seems it's going to happen regardless. And if there's anything that these big organisations can offer to make that process more streamlined, I think they should be considering doing exactly that. You can not yeah. like it. You can say, I, I don't approve of this, but you can help people when something is pretty much inevitable now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, a, and a very short length of time to when this um, comes into effect, because um, there are a huge amount of, of dogs out there, if, uh, as you said, that will need to be neutered. Now, yeah. the waiting list, I'm sure, is um, huge at many, many vets. So what if... It is, apparently, you, yes. You know, what if you, you can't reach that deadline and you've done, got all the all the information, like I've, yeah. I've phoned my vet, I've made an appointment, it's not till April or what have you. Where does... Um, or is it a case that as long as you're making the moves to make this happen? I, you, I think uh, this well, is a really good question dog. because this is coming up a lot. First of all, there are far too many dogs to get through. We're already in a backlog of court cases. We're already struggling to get cases heard in a timely manner. They're talking about an amnesty process. I think this compensation scheme is probably part of that. Um, they're going to have to come up with a version of this that allows a, a kind of interim version of, um, of being an owner of a banned breed until that case can be dealt with effectively by the court. They're going to have to do something completely different with that. Now, um, remember, in law, a dog is not a banned breed until a court say it is. So if you are challenged by police in January and you haven't yet insured or neutered your dog, technically, as things stand in the law as it is, and we expect it to be the same, that's not an offence. The offence becomes the police saying, I think it might be, we're going to take it, we're going to take you to court and prove it. So it's not a case of you, you can't commit an offence on something you haven't been convicted of. Therefore, until or unless there's a scheme that, that does an interim version of that dog is a banned breed, um, but you provided a suitable paperwork, so it's OK for now, wait for your court date. That's going to have to happen in some form. There's just no other way to deal with it. Um, yeah. That with, with, you know, even on a conservative estimate, if there were 20,000 of these dogs needing to go through challenges and, and court processes, there's no way that the court's going to be able to deal with us. They can't deal with what we've got now. Um, but don't panic is the point. Get things in place. If I know people now who are saying they've tried to book neutering and they're booked for February because the vets are overrun. Do it anyway. Get it booked in and keep an email. Keep proof that you've done it because, yes, good intent and an intention to satisfy the law, I think, is going to make a difference. It, it certainly does in most of the cases we deal with already. Go and join the Dogs Trust. Get your insurance in place. You can do that. 25 quid. You're sorted for the year. You must keep it up every year. You can't have even a single day's gap if you have a banned breed. Um if the ban starts in January, Dogs Trust will then start issuing you a, sp a specific certificate for your banned breed. But technically, a banned breed is not a banned breed until the court says it is, because sometimes we disagree as experts. We go to court and a colleague of mine was in court the other day with two dogs who'd been seized nearly a year. Um, three different police officers saying, yeah, yeah, definitely pit bulls. Court agreed with him. They weren't. and They're going home. So until that moment when the court says, yes, it is, they are not banned breeds and you can't break the law if you're not convicted. Please just put things in place. Engage with the behaviourist. If your dog is a little bit tricky over certain things, go and get some help. Um, there's been a lot of questions, and I think we need to touch on this, about what do you do with puppies? Now, nobody wants to be neutering puppies too early. However... There's a lot of talk about, oh, the law says they can't be typed until they're nine months old, so I'm, I'm going to leave it. I've got my puppy. I'm going to wait. That's not the law. 
it's it's a sort of um, good practice guideline that you don't look at a dog and, until it's at least nine or ten months old and say, yeah, that is a pit bull or an XL or whatever. But right. that's good practice, not the law. You can type from birth if you're so inclined. Um, so ignore any suggestion that that's the law and your dog's safe until it's nine months old. That's not the case at all. If you're challenged, they can do it earlier. In In real life, we want the dog to be um, grown enough to measure and compare the different characteristics and realistically until the nine, 10 months old, that's not really an option. Um, so forget this, you're fine till nine months. I know there's some concern about being forced to neuter earlier than they would want to. There's no exceptions to that. If your dog's 12 months old, you're challenged and the court says, yes, that is an XL bully, you will have to have it neutered. They're not interested in what vets say, what experts say, the law says it has to be neutered or it has to be destroyed. Bear that in mind. Right. So it's the need to get neutered, need to get insurance, make sure your chip is up to date. Yes. Um, get muzzle trained, make sure it's good on lead. Yes. Um, and get a behaviourist uh, trainer on board if you are struggling. Yes. Um, yeah. But it also think about, you know, um, say you've got a family with two adults, three adults, four adults in, in the household. Now, is it true that the dog can only be registered and go out with one named person? Not go out, just be registered. So what happens in the court process is a keeper is defined and they must be over, over uh, 16. Um, a person in charge of the dog must be 16 or over. A person who is registered as the keeper, the court prefer them to be 18 plus, but only one keeper can be identified. And that is your dog for the rest of its life. You can't buy, sell, exchange, abandon or give away or breed from a banned breed, the neutering. So it's one of those out on its own, of course. If you become the keeper of a dog and and you move house, you change jobs and you can't keep that dog as its keeper anymore, the dog has to go back to court to be destroyed because you cannot change the keeper of a dog. And the dog is only allowed to be away from its registered address for 30 days a year. It allows you to go on holiday, put the dog in kennels, but it's it's not just the keeper that can be in charge of the dog. Ideally, it should just be somebody right. more than 16. Um, okay. So any any family member, friend, professional dog walkers walk them. That's not the problem. Um, the problem is if you, your circumstances change and you can't keep the dog, unless you are seriously ill and incapacitated or sadly pass away, a new keeper cannot be identified. Um, I've had two cases where we've reassessed um, exempted pit bulls uh, in the last year or two where um, the person sadly became so ill they could not physically deal with the dog anymore. And uh, a family member stepped up uh, in both of those cases and we put that to the court and the dog was re-exempted to a different address with a different keeper. But short of that, there's no option for that. Bear that in mind. If you're committing and saying, I'm going to be that dog's keeper, it's your dog forever, unless you sadly pass away or something terrible happens to you. Um, and and they, they are quite strict about this. Now, let's just come back briefly to the, the issue of stray dogs. If a stray dog is picked up, put in a kennel in the dog pound and is not chipped or the chip person is not traceable and the owner doesn't come forward, those dogs, usually most pounds have um, a, a police dog legislation officer who visits every couple of weeks and says, yeah, that is, no, it isn't. Um, those dogs are destroyed because you cannot force a new keeper onto a banned breed. And that is the fate facing an awful lot of these XL bullies come January. There's lots in rescue. There's lots in, in pounds. And these dogs do not stand a chance unless they're adopted with a with a suitable keeper. And a keeper has to be considered by the court to be fit and proper. Now, you don't have to be perfect. Um, plenty of keepers do have versions of criminal records. It, you just must, you're not be, you, you can't be somebody who's convicted of violence or previous dog offences or anything like that. But you do not have to be perfect. Um, lots of people have convictions from when they were quite young. The court's not particularly interested in any of that. So it's not a question of my criminal record. I cannot be the keeper of a band break. That's not true. The relevance of that would be the deciding factor. 
But if you know of or you are somebody who could adopt a large bull breed between now and January and as close as you can be sure of anything in life, offer it a lifetime home, then please do that. Because a lot of these dogs sadly will die in January because they they legally cannot be rehomed. Yeah, that's um doesn't bear thinking about, does it really? No, it's horrible. I mean, I've spoken to um, rescue staff. I've run rescue myself many times over the years. And um, there are some completely distressed staff and rescues. They're being inundated on a daily basis and having to turn dogs away. There's just no space anywhere. And by the time they could offer a space, some of these dogs will be dead. So yeah. please, if you are somebody who needs to rehome your dog, explore every option because the best you can hope for is you'll go on a waiting list and it'll be too late to give the rescue your dog. Please engage with professionals, get some help, get some training, do something, but don't have a situation where I've, I've seen people complaining, I've been waiting for three weeks for a rescue to take my dog, nobody will take it. That's not their problem. They are facing questions like yours 20, 30 times a day. They can't fit everything in. There's just no space anymore. Um, if you're getting rid of your dog, I've, I saw one the other day because it growled at one of the children. Yeah, terrible, but separate it for now. Go and get some help. See if you can solve the problem because usually you can. There's no need to be um, blaming rescues and forcing dogs onto rescues because you've got a bit of a problem. And I'm not talking about, seriously aggressive dogs or dogs who are who are liable to seriously injure your child or anybody else for that matter but a lot of these are just fairly young dogs who are a bit out of sorts that or the the baby's a bit bigger and he's crawling and frightening them get some help this is what we do yeah. for a living behaviorist we fix these problems so stop relying on rescue to pick up the, the pieces at the minute they just do not have the space or the resources to do any of that anymore just yeah. be responsible as an owner and do everything you can. Otherwise, you will be the person come January. If you've got one of those types of dogs, you'll be the person having to put it to sleep because you don't want it and nobody else legally can take it off your hands. Yeah. Um, but it, I'm it, sure this will this will hopefully push people into seeking help from I hope so. qualified behaviourist and trainer to help them through any little glitches because we all get glitches. Um, of course uh, we do. Sort if of, we, you know, if we all knew what was going to happen, and if we all knew what course, was going to happen in, in yeah. our lives, we'd, we'd, we'd win the lottery, wouldn't we? That's not going to oh, happen. Ab absolutely. And I think also for you to think about your own emotions going through all this because you being stressed as an owner wondering what you can do what's going to happen is going to sort of put stress onto your dog your Absolutely. emotional state has a huge yeah. um, amount um effect on your dog yes. so think about how you are in all these situations um and reach out and get help because yes. when we don't know what to do this is when we get stressed we get angry and yes. um this gets transferred over onto our dogs so you know yeah go out there and get supported and please um, stop relying on facebook as a source of information oh gosh because yes. every day i used to correct some of them but they're just abusive when you try and put them on the right track so i don't none of us bother anymore um you know stuff this dna stuff this the dogs trust aren't insuring you they what do i do now it's nonsense so please don't use facebook as your source of what's going to happen in a ban it's not correct most of it yeah. So your your website. I've got a question here. Must must ask you from from That's Henry right. Bennett. But um, going back to what you were saying um, there, I forgot what I was going to ask now. I've got a, I'm right. like a butterfly. Um, <laughs> it's, it's it's Monday morning. It's what Monday were you morning. It's about? very oh, difficult. Very Lord. difficult. Um, Ask oh, the question. It'll come I'll back ask to the you question. Once it you might stop well thinking about it. Well, yes, yeah. absolutely. So, from Kerry, um, where owners stand with regards to living in a rented property, as the dogs were brought prior to becoming a banned breed, as I know yeah. this is a huge concern to many. The, this is a huge concern, and I've spoken to a few housing associations. We, we've we've faced this as experts many times in the past. Now, the problem that some people will have is that. You may already have an agreement in writing that your a landlord, whoever that might be, council, housing association, private, has given you written permission to keep a dog or dogs. Now, 
The problem with that is if you go on these websites that belong to the companies who are your landlords, there's often a fine small print that says you cannot own a dog, even if it's exempted, if it is a prohibited breed. Your dog that's fine today might not be fine on the 1st of January. Now, there's no simple solution to this. I've spoken to a few housing associations. Um, there are two or three nationally who who uh, have said if the dog's exempted, it's fine. Um, I have heard a rumour that one of them has been having meetings about now the Excel's being added, whether they should actually continue with that. It, it's how long you've been a tenant, what your tenancy agreement actually says and what the fine print says is going to be a real challenge for some people. Um, I've already raised this with the EFRA committee. I've written to DEFRA about it. I think this is going to cause a huge housing crisis. I think there are significant numbers of dogs that are going to fall under the type. And I think there are families out there who potentially could end up in court losing their home. There's no simple answer. Check your tenancy agreement. Have a look at the fine print on your landlord's website and see what it says. I have pointed out to a number of associations that the reality of these dogs is that they're neutered, they're insured, they have to be of a decent temperament to be exempted back to the owner. And the court is saying that owner is a fit and proper person to own a dog of this type. How much more safe could a dog be? than being owned in those circumstances. And I've pointed this out, that the reality is, that, I mean, I, I spoke to a housing association a few weeks ago who I think were under the impression that somebody does a DNA test and goes, oh, yeah, that's Pitbull or an XL, or, and, and it definitely is one, and therefore is inherently dangerous. And they were a little surprised to discover that any dog of any mix-up who just looks a bit like one can be one. So I hope they're rethinking that on that basis. Um, it is a concern. It's why I've raised it with, with the government, with uh, EFRA and DEFRA. Um, I think if anybody feels that they may be in, in trouble in this, I think they should be um, appealing to their housing and speak to their MP. Uh, this isn't a question of, you're not asking, should we ban or not these dogs? Because Theresa Coffey says it's happening no matter what anybody says. And I think it will. It's a question of... Um, are housing going to take many thousands of people nationally to court to say you can't keep that dog anywhere, anymore that's been fine with no complaints up to this point? Yeah. It may end up with a, with a judicial review and a legal challenge on the principles, which is very expensive. Um, but it, it, is, it absolutely is a concern and there's no simple reassurance I can give you other than get your dog as legal as possible and appeal to them on the basis of what I've just said. Compared to the average person with, you know, some crossbreed down the road that's always running out and chasing the neighbours, your dog would be inherently much more safe than that. A court says so. An expert says so. I, I don't yeah. know what else. I don't know what else these housing associations are going to want, but will they have an appetite to take literally thousands of their tenants to court? I'm not sure that's going to happen, but I get you're a person with a home and a family and I get why you're worried about it. Get your tenancy, yeah. read the small print, speak to your housing association or you, a lot of people have a, a nominated housing officer for their address or, or area. Um, you may have to start having these conversations come the end of the year in preparation. But I know people have already been sent letters by the housing saying, we think you've got an Excel bully, you're going to have to get rid of it by January. Now, technically, that is unlawful as we speak, and a couple of other points on that matter. If a housing association or a landlord of any description writes to you and says, you've got seven days, 21 days, 28 days to get rid of that dog, that is not a lawful request. They have to go to court to get either an injunction, which means you get a chance to bring your own evidence to it because they have to tell you it's happening and declare what they're using to define why they're asking you to do that, or they have to take you to court because your dog has caused some form of a nuisance under your tenancy agreement. They can't simply turn up and take your dog. They can't kill your dog. They can't remove your dog. An injunction could force you to remove your dog, but it would be your day in court to argue the point, and it would have to be done legally. 
or they'd have to take um, a, you through the eviction process saying that you've, you're in breach of your tenancy agreement. Yeah. Um, in, in advising a lot of people over the last few years on this, we've discovered tenancy agreements that aren't lawful, um, changes to tenancy agreement that were never agreed or signed for. Um, one lady recently, she's been a tenant for 22 years. The original document that she signed doesn't even exist anymore. They were claiming that she didn't have written permission. Well, she's always had dogs from the first time she was a tenant. And it was argued by a solicitor back to the housing that the changes that they've made since in producing a new tenancy agreement at various points, which none of the tenants had ever signed, they've just written to them and said, here's a new tenancy agreement, not signed, not right. agreed. There were other legal points to do with changes to the pet policy, again, sent out, not agreed, not signed for. You can't even prove that they've read it, never mind anything else. Yeah. They ended up agreeing with the lady that she could, um, without setting any precedent in court, they agreed that she could, in fact, keep her dog, which is great. There's lots and lots of very legal tenancy complications are going to come to play in this. And there's a few organisations, the dog clinic for a start, um, if if you go and Google the dog clinic, they they've been working with I think three specialist housing solicitors in the past few months on the XL problem. So if you go to the dog clinic and contact them, they can put you in touch with one of the specialist housing solicitors and have a conversation with them about what your options are. That's lovely. I think it's the dogclinic.co.uk if people are looking okay, for just, it. Yeah, I'll I'll write that down. I'll put that link yeah. in. Look yeah please, please do here. please do they have um, got um they have got an email specially set up for it can't remember what it is offhand it's something like excel bully tenancy whatever but it, if you contact the dog clinic they will get in touch with you and they will pass you on to one of the specialist housing uh, solicitors who are as concerned as everybody else is that this is going to be a much bigger crisis than the government has even considered yeah yeah absolutely Oh, that that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you for that. I got another question here also, yep. which was um, sitting at the forefront of my my mind. Um, professional dog walkers and boarding kennels. Um, yep. Will they have to take out special insurance? Are they still insured? What's the crack there? This is another good point. And if you if you're on Facebook and you come to my main business page, my dog has bitten. Um, we've been discussing this quite a few times as a professional. I've had to deal with my own insurers on exactly this point. Now, there's a lot of stuff going around Facebook saying, um, I'm not covered. I can't walk dogs. You're going to have to sign a disclaimer. If you're XL bully that I've been walking for six months and it becomes banned in January, I can't walk it anymore. That's not entirely the case. First of all, there is no legal requirement for you to have insurance. There probably should be, but there isn't. Secondly, I've asked... Um, for mine to be extended to cover exempted dogs, and that's just been approved. So if you have a wording in your policy that says that you can't um, deal with, handle, be responsible for certain types of dogs, the answer is write a risk assessment, write out your CV, contact your insurers and say, I want to be covered for dealing with these dogs. I'm safe. Look. That's what I've done. I have quite. I, I, I have a certificate in risk assessing. I teach a course on risk assessment for dog professionals. Um, I've got quite a complicated risk assessment for handling dogs at assessments and in other circumstances. I've got an extensive CV. Um, I've never, ever needed to claim on my insurance um, for however many years I've had it. Not that that's the most relevant factor, but possibly it plays a part in this. I don't know. Um, even if you've got a, a thing, the, the thing to go and look at is what do your exclusions say? What I discovered is mine was so badly written, I've ended up um, going to Brooks Braithwaite, who are the underwriters for a lot of dog policies. They're not the only one. But the wording said something like, you are excluded from a cover for dogs falling under the DDA and something else that makes no sense at all. That's not a legal definition. Um, I contacted them, and to be fair, Brooks Braithwaite have been really helpful. They explained, yes, they did mean exempted dogs, dogs that the court says are banned breeds, but it didn't say that, and they're rewording their policy exclusions to explain that. 
but they did invite me and they invite anybody and I, your own insurer, so whoever your underwriter is, I'm sure will have a similar option. Mm -hmm. I sent them my CV, explained uh, what my job role is and uh, a full risk assessment for the handling and dealing with all of the dogs that I deal with. And bear in mind, I'm dealing with ones that have usually bitten one or more people at the point I got hands on them. Um, and they've just extended my cover for it. And they are rewording the exclusions to make more sense in future. So if you are a professional at the moment, your policy leads you to believe you are not covered for certain dogs, exempted, banned breeds, whatever, contact your insurers in the first instance. And if you're not happy with the response, go to your underwriters and ask your underwriters to define the clause, first of all, and to ask whether you can have that cover extended. You're going to have to prove you're safe. That's the thing. You're going to have yeah. to explain who you are, how you do the job, what safety you've got in place. I mean, for me, it goes further than the average dog walker is going to uh, need to have because we've got specialist equipment and sprays to protect ourselves and things in place that we rarely, rarely ever even need to get out of the van. But everything is there. Should there be a problem, we've already covered it. And that's the route that you need to take. You need to prove you're safe and ask for that cover to be extended. I was told by somebody who has a different underwriter to me, um, that that they had spoken to their underwriters. I can't remember who, who it was offhand, I'm sorry, but that they'd been asked to ask for an extension to cover those dogs and to explain why they needed to, what the job was. And again, what's your risk assessment? What's our level of risk that we're underwriting for? And what experience have you got? That's the way to deal with that. Yeah. Whether you're a kennels, a dog walker, because I've, I've discussed this, Kennels, dog walkers, uh, doggy daycare, there's a lot of them saying oh, we can't take them anymore, we can't take any any bull breeds because they might be XLs and our cover doesn't cover it. That may well be true in, in come January, technically you're not covered. I know some organisations um, have suggested that, um, that you get the owner to sign a disclaimer to say they understand that you do not have insurance cover. Um, there's nothing to stop you doing that. You can't disclaim liability if you're handling somebody's dog and it bites somebody else. The law says you're responsible. That's not the point. Yeah. Um, but a disclaimer saying, I know that you're not covered by insurance for this. I, I'm not entirely comfortable with that, but that's a personal choice that people have to make. I think the sensible thing to do is talk to your insurers. And if the insurance company themselves are not helpful, go to your underwriters and they're the ones ultimately who make the decision as to what you are and are not covered for please just talk to them and, and do let me know on the my dog is bitten page how are you getting on because the discussions we've had a few on there and they've been really helpful to other professionals who are not quite sure how to take this forward I, i'm not a fan of writing something that says yeah you know i'm not insured so tough that doesn't sit very well with me but there might be people left in that position i'm not sure yet yeah yeah so you were saying that you know there, there's there's lots of misinformation out there from on, on websites and facebook groups and all the rest of it tell us where we can keep updated your facebook group your website you yeah, um, yeah. the if, if you come to um my dog has bitten on facebook um you can message me there it's usually me that picks them up not exclusively but usually um, there's uh, lots of I, I use it mainly to post about the cases I'm in court. You'll see pictures of dogs that we've just finished a court case about what happened in that. I don't give the person's name. I don't give the dog's name. But you can see pictures of all the dogs who've survived the process and the sort of conditions that have been put on them going forward. Um, you can see the scroll down. You'll see some posts discussing items that have been in the news, um, some bits about Excel's. I've done a kind of um, advice sheet for people who think they might have an Excel bully. You can find that on there. If you can't message me on there, I'll send it straight to you. There's a whole series of infographs that I've created, general rules about dog law, about tenancy problems, about um, adopting a rescue dog and good practice before, during and after those first few weeks when you get it. Um, and there's a new and the newest one is the Excel. So you can you can get any of those infographs on my dog has bitten. There's a few on my Safe Pets website uh, on my Safe Pets Facebook page as well. But you will find you can message me on there. You can talk to me. There are websites behind all of this. 
Um, and please contact the dog clinic specifically. It, first of all, if you've been involved in an incident involving a, a dog bite or a police challenge of some sort, speak to the dog clinic. But if you contact the dog clinic specifically about tenancy advice, they've they've been encouraging. They're on uh, TikTok as I'm really bad at TikTok. I've only just joined, but please come and join me on there if you want to. I'm struggling a bit with with that form of technology. Um, but if you're on TikTok, do come and follow me. You can message on there, I'm told. I've probably missed half a dozen messages now. Um, but if you uh, – Dog Clinic are on there as, I think, help police seized my dog or something like that. Okay. Um, if you're also on Facebook, you can go to a group called Rocky's Army. Um, Rookies Army are a fundraising group who help people who are going through a court process with their dog for whatever reason. And they do help with advice, but they also help with a little bit of fundraising here and there as well. If you can't afford uh, fees, but you don't get legal aid. So uh, Rookies Army, who have a sister group that I think uh, is called Help Police Have Seized My Dog. Um, and you come to my Facebook page as an independent expert and ask me advice, um, which is my dog has bitten. Um, I think I'm Debbie Dog Expert on TikTok, but you might find my dog has bitten on there as well. Oh. I get a bit confused by that. I'll have a I'll have a little little look. But, I am yeah, on Twitter, my, which my is IT well. Skills are... Um, I'm on Twitter as I think it's Debbie underscore Connolly. I know I know whatever they call in Twitter now is kind of old hat now, but those of us older people, we're still there. <laughs> I, I never go on to Twitter. Um <laughs> but there yes, oh I IT is just like not my <laughs> thing particularly. I, I love technology. Do you know? I, I love the fact that I think social media is is a devil at times, but I think spreading you can spread good and bad information you can get yeah. good information out there really quickly to lots and lots of people and i think that's its benefit if you're looking at rehoming dogs or trying to get the truth out there it's really helpful but unfortunately those avenues are also open to people who don't know what they're talking about and and who persist in glory seeking and spreading nonsense because they just want to admit that they don't know so um yeah. yes i'm, I'm really for it and against confusing. it confusing Really, really mm. confusing um, to know what Very. is right, what is wrong. So for you to, uh, we'll put all those links down there. Um, yeah, Marshall please do. And, and copy and paste. Let's see, um, Alison's already put um, your website there. My dog has oh, bitten. thank you, Alison. Oh, the, the, the Facebook one. Um, Great, thank and, you. And, um, so we, we know we can be 100% um, sure that the information mm. that um, everybody's getting is um up to date and absolutely correct. And, and we perhaps should repeat this closer to the end of the year because by then yes. i would hope that the description of what these dogs are meant to look like has been released and we can talk in a bit more depth about it then um so i think it is something i've done i've done a few of these lives for different groups so if if you're out there and you're somebody who runs a group and, and wants a chat like this please just talk to me because if we're not educating people things are going to go even more wrong than they have already Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we will definitely would love to um, touch base again with you when we we know um, firmed up on the bully type and yeah. uh, when things are if they're ever going to be um, more. Um, yes, life will clarity. never be the same again. Yeah, no, indeed. But um, oh, Debbie, we've taken up enough of your time. That's I know so you're an extremely busy lady, but cannot thank you enough for... Um, no, thank you for the invite. Really Always appreciated. Please talk to me. Bear with me if I don't answer immediately. It's usually because I've got a yes. mad dog on the lead. Um, I'm in court all day tomorrow, so don't uh, rush for answers tomorrow. But, but, you know, come along, ask a question, and, and either myself or one of my trusted assistants will come back to you as soon as possible. But thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody, for watching. If you've got any more questions, put them um, down here and um, I'll try and get Debbie to answer them as we go through the coming weeks. But as you say, very busy lady, so we'll do our best for you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.